tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Segment intro and host welcome. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about lurid lichens and ominous occurrences. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Glenn B. Dungan and cryptic wonder are voice talents Paul J. McSorley, Justine Anastasia, Olivia Steele, Jesse Cornett, and Nick Goroff. Now, get your ticket ready. Take your seat in our theater of the minds and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first story tonight is written by Glenn B. Dungan and performed by Paul J. McSorley and Justine Anastasia. In it, we will meet two detectives Dacary and Margot, as they investigate a mysterious lichen that has taken over a town carnival in Florida. As they navigate through the wilderness and rot, they discover that the lichen is a sort of virus. Without further ado, I present to you Beyond the Zero. It is the smell that Dacary notices first. A sour odor, not quite spoiled, but rather acidic, wafts through the air. It joins the thick artificial popcorn butter and the sucrose of cotton candy to make a nauseating maelstrom of humidity which permeates through the Florida marsh. The colors come second. Baby blue orchids and ruby red roses poke out from the specimen's flesh, crawling to the sun as if to scream repentance. The stalk of a sunflower sprouts in the center of the creature's brows bursting upwards and opening great yellow leaves to hug the world. That is what Dacry calls it. A creature, or specimen. The words are interchangeable. But it had hopes and dreams, however small and limited it would be, to be found living in a muggy and dragonfly patrolled town carnival in some forgotten Floridian town. The flowers sprouting from its body stretch into a rotting bed that is approximately eight feet long. The creature has been pulled apart perhaps from the vines that cling to its separated torso and waist, like the strings of a marinette. Or perhaps the vines came separately. The skeleton has long since decomposed beyond recognition of even gender. Even its clothes have been absorbed by the moss and brought into the marsh. What remains of its jaw hangs off on a hinge with the opening of the mouth filled with dirt occupied by fungi that is not native to this humid climate. The hollows of its eyes are covered in moss, like a double eye patch. Dacry takes out a hanky and wipes his brows of sweat. He rolls up his sleeves and reaches into his pocket for a cigarette. He loosens his tie, ignites the tobacco in between thin lips, and walks away from the creature to survey the open marsh that expands into a full square mile. Lichen and frogs swim to the surface, and in the deep, probably a crocodile or an alligator. Dacry always gets them confused. He hears the crunching of his partner's boots before she announces herself. Dacry already has a cigarette waiting for her. No thanks. I promised Sophia I'd stop. 
Margot said. Cutting out bourbon, too? Margot smirked. How do you think we met? Dacry looks out to the marsh, stifles a smile at his partner. Small towns like this give me the creeps, says a detective in a state with mainly marshland. He closes his eyes and forces the strange specimen's presence out of his mind. A lemonade mixer buzzes for no one. Hamburger wrappers and plastic hot dog containers move like tumbleweeds in the muggy wind. The rickety Ferris wheel peeks from over the trees, carriages dangling in the sky like forgotten Christmas ornaments. Figures dangle out of the bars. Limbs hang at odd angles. Dacry cannot make details, but he does recognize the difference between long arms and short ones. He wonders if any bodies are slumped against the base of the wheel, and if any have skulls broken from impact during a botched attempt to escape from the highest carriage. He wonders if these people even knew that death was upon them. For some reason, the alternative makes him more anxious. He fears that whatever force has befallen the fair is invisible, elusive, that the people did not understand the madness or could not comprehend it. Maybe, Dacre counters to himself, maybe that is more of a blessing. Margot looks over her shoulder. Her thick black hair is matted against her forehead, shiny with sweat. Her hair is put up in a knot that had once looked professional, but now was as unkempt as Dacre's own five o'clock shadow. She is smarter than Dacre in the temperature department. She keeps her blazer in the car and rolls up her sleeves. Dacre slings his blazer over his forearm. He is getting tired holding it. I try to find some water, but I don't think that's a good idea, she says. I'd rather drink the marsh, Dacre says. He flicked the cigarette into the dirt and crushed it with the heel of his boot. They walk through a cluster of empty tents and stalls. Stuffed animals cling to the wall behind a stacked row of bottles, never to be claimed by a child who can knock each bottle down with a slingshot. Grills of burnt sausages hold a collection of burnt hot dogs that look like scabbed fingers. Ice boxes containing beer have lost all their ice and become pools of warm muggy water. The paper labels long since peeled and floated to the top. The counters are sticky with spilled lemonade and cola. The two detectives approach a strength test with the meter broken. Daiquiri bends down and examines the mallet. He looks up at the meter and wonders if he could ever pass the test and ring the bell. He never could. He nudges the mallet with the butt of his pistol, afraid to touch it. The moss is dark red, the color of blood, and covers a portion of the face of the mallet. It looks almost like the point of impact, like it had been used as a weapon. A bead of sweat trails down the bridge of his nose and falls on the moss, erupting a froth of gurgling foam. It sizzles like a chemical burn before receding back into the moss, leaving a sweat-drop-sized mark of black against the red. Daiquiri. Margot calls from around the corner. You've got to check this out. He follows her voice and rounds to a dunk tank. The water is dark green with a layer of algae clinging to the sides and skimming to the top. Dandelions and tulips pop out like ribbons. The platform above the tank has collapsed. In the briny water, a silhouette lay in stasis, suspended in the icor, arms outstretched. The algae creeps over the edge of the still water, moving like clawing fingers over the metal bolted rim of the tank. The sign above is blanketed by a thin layer of sediment and scum and hangs diagonally. Words written in algae with as much precision as a marker to a whiteboard grows from the splintered wood. Rejoice, repent, revive. The world accepts palms up to the sun, the hands of the moss prophet. Daggery notices that Margot is holding her pistol before he notices that he has instinctively gotten his out as well. He sets his coat on one of the red and white draped picnic tables. The dunk tank stretches away from them, the shadowy figure floating blissfully in its moss-blanketed womb. Beyond, near the edge of the marsh and the entrance to the carnival, the specimen lay succumbed to the earth. They strafe along the paths, hearing the crunching of sand underneath their boots. Empty stalls box them in, cash registers and tip jars with soggy bills. Scabs of algae start on corners and crept on to folding plastic chairs. Dandelions pop up from random spots on the ground without any dirt or fertilization. Purple orchids and azure tulips cling to the tops of torn tents like barnacles. 
The Porto Johns are covered almost entirely with a thin layer of algae that creeps from the ground. Blue and orange petals line over green fuzz. The doors are welded shut with spongy ichor, and occasionally their heels give in to some surrendering of the land as if softened by invisible rainfall. The ferris wheel looms above the trees, the carriages swinging vacantly in some higher wind. The slumped figures are still shadowed with distance, but Dacry can now make out details of arms hanging limp through metal barriers, of foreheads pressed in between the gaps. I don't like this place, Dacry, Margot says, her eyes darting from the fuzzy Porto Johns. Me neither. He puts his back to hers, keeps his fingers on his gun. Beads of sweat trail down Dacry's back. Beyond them, the wind rustles. He feels the eyes of the dung tank drifting towards him, bobbing in some contaminated womb. The specimen is far away now. He wants to submit to the psychic, unexplainable sense that the flowers sprouting from the creature's brows, thighs, forearms, follow him as they would the sun. He wants to. It will be easier. The Moss Prophet, Margot says. She repeats. The Moss Prophet? Sounds like a cult, Dacry says. He does not know why they stopped here, in the middle of the designated Portageon zone, but they did. He kicks away a baseball cap. Empty plastic cans of lemonade and hamburger wrappers litter the grounds, each their own biome of infectious moss that wiggle all its fibers in the beating sun. The trash cans, previously overflowed, have been absorbed entirely by the land and now stick up like totems of seamless carpet, rounded lumps threatening to pierce from the mud like a zith. The ferris wheel reaches into the sky. A door opens with the sound of shredding paper. A figure flops out like a fallen broom. Margot aims, fires. Birds escape from the trees and into the clouds. Dacary swears he notices their feathers dipped in what appear to be dark green tar. Margot gestures to Dacary, and they walk across the court. She takes position next to an overturned trash can that is blanketed by wriggling algae, switching gaze to the other doors. The figure is in Dacry's iron sights, and he knows from the sudden hissing of gas akin to a deflating balloon and the pungent sour smell of rotting vegetables that whatever this creature is seems to be either a mannequin or halfway to becoming a specimen. He knows for certain that it is not human. Not anymore. It slumps into the foliage, its nose pressed into the dirt. Its skull is half caved in with an indent from the bullet. It looks like a stone pierced a rotting pumpkin. It is hairless and green, and in the shine of the Floridian sun, it seems to glisten with a caked layer of sweat. Its features, half buried, are either absent or transformed. The dimensions of a normal nose have been reduced to something upturned and skeletal, the eyes poking out purple and yellow orchids in full bloom. Moss creeps from the darkness of its lungs and lines the roof of its mouth clawing upwards into some reverse mustache. Ladybugs traverse on its limp tongue. The interior of the Porto John emits the impression of some infinite cosmic void. Do you see anything? Margot calls from across the lot. Dacry bends down, ignores the bead of sweat trailing down the bridge of his nose to his upper lip. No, he says. Just a body. Don't trust that explanation, Dacry. Dacry looks into the flowers that occupy the creature's eyes. They are beautiful. A ladybug crawls from the inside of its cheek and nestles on the layer of moss underneath its nose. Its shell is pink, and what Dacry has originally perceived to be dots are instead strange stars, as if the dots had bled out its ink. He takes the pistol and uses it to nudge the skull. A plume of rotting vegetable smell almost knocks Dacry backwards. He closes his mouth stops his breathing. The flesh is soft. He felt like he was pushing into a cake. The air around him becomes thick, amplified by the muggy humidity. Dacry grits his teeth and presses the 22 caliber into the creature's elbow. It offers no resistance, the flesh squishy and receding into an even spongier swollen bone. He swallows a fist of rotting vegetables. Margot comes to check on Dacry ten minutes later. He hunches over, one hand on his knee, the other on a sun-heated bench. Orange vomit cascades onto the dirt next to discarded hot dog wrappers and containers of chili. Mint? She holds out a white capsule. He takes one, chews, swallows. 
You're supposed to suck on them. They're not gum, she says. He pulls out a cigarette and cups the flame away from a warm gust of wind. I took it as a courtesy. Margot looks back. They are 40 feet from the Porta John lot. The Ferris wheel looms to their left, glittering from the sun. How much light do we have left? Dacry asks. Couple of hours. Did you call for backup? I needed to do something while you were tasting your breakfast sausages again. Dacry inhales, taking long drags to eradicate the sour taste of vomit that cakes on his tongue. Rejoice, repent, revive. The world accepts, palms up to the sun, the hands of the moss prophet. Spooky. I'll say. Margot says. Margot shields her eyes from the sun. She faces the collection of portajons, standing stagnant like old relics. Her shoulder perks upwards, turning away from the looming ferris wheel. Daiquiri wonders if this is conscious or if he is overthinking it. What do you think happened? Daiquiri shrugs. Could be anyone's guess. The moss prophet? She says, turning to him. Either something religious happened here, or sure as hell tried to. Nothing here makes any sense, Daiquiri. Nothing at all. It's bizarre. Gives me the creeps. I could use a bourbon right about now. Me too. Let's head back before dark. I don't want to be out here without my flashlight. Daiquiri squashes out the butt of the cigarette with the heel of his boot. And let's stop wasting time. They started their advance once Margot's nerves and Daiquiri's stomach settled. They skirt the edges of the Porta John Collective and wade in between the stalls once more. Moss has advanced on the sticky picnic benches and little bulbs litter along patches of green like festering zits, the moss on top of the tents inch closer to one another, bridging the empty space. It spears out, ignorant of gravity, like fingers yearning to touch. Their speed slows when they approach the dunk tank, and they skirt the perimeter as if it is a wild animal. The figure remains in stasis, shadowed in the murky algae-infested waters. Strings of kelp now loft from the bottom, trailing from its thighs and forearms, a crema of algae bobs in the sun-beaten wind. The sign, written in a thriving, wriggling ecosystem of moss, now features deep purple orchids and scarlet roses. The moss has become more vibrant, turning the words into bulging, wriggling, blistering masses. Strange ladybugs crawl along the rim of the tank. This is impossible, Daiquiri says. How can the greenery grow so fast here? Margot shakes her head, looking up at the sign, her eyes fixated on Moss Prophet. The only thing that grows this fast is cancer. Daiquiri grunts. He goes to the picnic table to retrieve his jacket, but discovers it is blanketed in its entirety by moss. The furry bristles move like seaweed underneath the river, feeling the air with tiny fingers. A beetle trots along the picnic table, and Daiquiri sees the formation of a miniature ecosystem. Mushrooms sprout from the layer of grass that carpeted the once red and white checkered cover. In vitro bulbs pulse and shine. The beetle roams, poking its horn into pustules of glowering bulbs. It is the color of ivory. He wanted to shoot it. Shoot the whole damn jacket. Leave it, Margot says. It's too hot anyway. She has not yet surrendered to total urgency but Daiquiri knows she is getting anxious. He is too. On patrols around town, she is more likely to explode in fits of frustration over the smallest things. Too much grease on her fingertips, the light taking too long at an intersection. She is a slow releasing and thus regulating valve of emotional turmoil. Yet throughout, she is known to keep her temper and Daiquiri knows that he will mentally break before she does. But when she does, Daiquiri might as well be alone. They joked at the precinct that the two of them are a perfect pair if the objective is to maintain an endurable state of collective frustration throughout the day. It is only a matter of time before one of them would snap. The weeds are getting to them both. They walk along the way they came, turning a corner on the footpath that leads to the sea of towering sunflowers connecting the main entrance of the fair to the rest of it. The stalks stretch to the sun at just above seven feet, forming almost an alleyway. It must have been beautiful, a reminder of summer and celebration. 
Still, the sunflower heads ignore the carnage and corruption that has swept over the fair like a noxious cloud. Bright yellow leaves sway in the breeze. The stalks interlace and form a wall with the sheer thickness of the clusters. The dirt path looks like a tightrope among a sea of sunshine. They stop at the threshold, looking down the warping path. Daiquiri and Margot hold their pistols with both hands, their palms slippery. Their armpits are damp with sweat, and the back of their forearms glisten in the sun from wiping perspiration from their brows. The sun crawls closer to the horizon, just below the pine trees. It disappears behind the ferris wheel. From this distance, and behind the prism of humidity, it seemed to pulse like an idle jellyfish. Daiquiri goes first, looking over his shoulder to make sure Margot's footsteps are real and she is indeed following him. He did not believe in ghosts, but as of today, he knows that he is not sure to believe in anything anymore. They walk along the path of single file, Margot walking backwards to cover their flank. The path dipped at the sides, creating a clear distinction that the dirt to their right and left belongs to sunflowers. It is impossible to see past three, four rows of stalks, and even in the depths of their cluster, they swayed in the wind. Daiquiri focuses ahead of him with a tunnel vision approach. In his periphery, he catches a glimpse of the yellow petals, of the white seeds in the middle. He only focuses on the exit. Anything that steps in front, even if it was the specimen reanimated, is subject to shooting. The sunflowers, Margot says. Shut up. Daiquiri speaks through gritted teeth. Margot's voice croaked, almost a sob. The sunflowers. Almost there, Margot. The sunflowers have teeth. The seeds are teeth. They're salivating. Daiquiri fights against his curiosity. He is taking short breaths now. His body shakes. Margot moans. Human teeth, Daiquiri. What has been unleashed here? Margot. Daiquiri stops, lets her bump into him. He reaches behind him and takes her wrist, half leading, half pulling through the path. He keeps his focus narrow, refusing to look at the ivory teeth that pull at him, refusing to examine the glimpses of torn flannel and wife beaters at the edges of the dirt, tangled in between sunflower stalks. He keeps his focus exclusively on the yellow, the familiar color of sunlight. It anchors him, assures him that whatever lurks at the precipice of his vision has not yet claimed everything. Margot kicks her heels into the dirt path. She twists her wrist to free from Daiquiri's grasp, but he holds harder. She swears, spits, weeps, even headbutts Daiquiri's shoulder from behind. She swings the pistol around like an extension of her fist, and Daiquiri thinks she has forgotten she was holding it. She had cracked. The sunflowers have broken her. They made it to the edge and Daiquiri uses the last of his strength to pull her with him as he lunges into the dirt. They tumble atop plastic cups sticky with cola and dropped hot dogs already infested with maggots. Margot's face falls on a candy wrapper, smearing sun-beat chocolate on her cheek, looking like an apostrophe of shit. Her face is red and blotchy, her eyes glassy with tears. Her lower lip balloons to one side, purple and lacerated from her own biting down. She looks at the clouds with a dumb, tired expression. Daiquiri rolls over onto his buttocks, sitting on some gravel. Patches of dirt scrape along his knees and his chest. He pushes a moss-claimed plastic hot dog canoe away with the nozzle of the 22. The sunflowers loomed behind him, taunting his curiosity, smiling. Smiling at him with a thousand little molars, dry and chalky from the sun. The two of them wait a bit until Daiquiri is sure Margot reclaimed her faculties. She looks away from him, and for a second in the coming twilight of the day, she looks almost like a child, ashamed to be afraid of the dark. It's fine, Daiquiri says, so she did not have to apologize. We made it. Don't tell anyone, okay? They wouldn't believe you about this place anyway. He chews the inside of his cheek. Come on. You need to follow me. Let's stay in the car. No, I need to see the creature. Margot's brows furrow. Her face returns to her normal self. You can't even call it human, Daiquiri? Is it? It was. Was it? Margot looks away at the setting sun. She says, Why? What solace would it give you? I need to know it's still there. The prospect of the alternative is more frightening. 
but I can't do it alone. Daiquiri, come on now. This is stupid. Why? Daiquiri looks at her. Because I'm afraid, Margot. But I'd rather be afraid and know than be afraid and not know. Margot looks back at the sunflowers, then trailed to the Ferris wheel across the open waters. She seems hardened, but not much more than Daiquiri. Touching insanity allowed her some immunity to it. She looks at him and gestures with her head to start moving. The marsh glitters and ripples before them. Behind the trees, the Ferris wheel is cast in shadow. Daiquiri takes Margot's hand and helps her up. Together, they walked along the marsh shore, keeping their eyes on the car to ensure that they could really leave and abandon their station. It crosses both of their minds. Waterflies skated across the water, leaving little curves of their wake. Daffodils and lotuses pierced the water in droves, anchoring onto something deep into the ichor. Lily pads gather along the shore like lazy bumper cars. The fairgrounds no longer smell of stale funnel cake and burnt meat. Now a weak, acidic odor of rotting vegetable burps from the marsh. The air turns from beating hot to chilly, and breeze hits their sweat-stained skin with icy kisses. They come upon the creature, but it, like Daiquiri has predicted, is not quite what it looked like when they left it. The flowers, which sprout from its forearms, thighs, and brows, had spread to its joints. Its dislodged jaw is covered with the mossy fur of pulsing algae. The sunflower, fortunately not mutated with teeth, seems to flap in the still air. Layers of moss stuck to the limbs of the creature and adhere it to the marsh. It looked like it was melting. Ladybugs crawl in and out of vacant eye sockets. Some move along the vines that push what remained of its sternum and waist to a length of nine feet. Flower buds blossom underneath cracked fingernails. There, Margot says. Are you happy? Let's get back to the car, Daiquiri says, thinking of lighting another cigarette to get rid of the smell. The sun is just beyond the crest of the trees now, casting the marsh with a purple and orange glow. Their backup is set to arrive in the next 30 minutes, and of what little words were exchanged between the two, they agreed that it could not pass fast enough. Empty stalls lingered on the grounds, flapping vine-laced tarp. Splotches of shining algae and golf-tossed plastic cups and fold-out chairs. They looked like scabs. Both Daiquiri and Margot keep to themselves, looking out to the marsh and the Ferris wheel beyond. Daiquiri is not sure what Margot feels, but he knows he wants to keep an eye on that creaking wheel. He smokes two cigarettes and leans on the hood of the car, his pistol within arm's reach. Margot sits on the hood, looking up at the orange clouds. Dandelions peek from the pines, like the light of an anglerfish. Green claws wrap disjointed and flower fingers along bark, not to pull the tree down, but to push itself up. A dislodged jawbone swings from the end of a cheekbone. The torso appears from the twilight-shaded trees, clawing at the neighboring branches to gain purchase. The vines stretch and tether along its spinal cord and disappear into the depth of the forest like the marionette strings of a hidden puppeteer. Spots of moss cling to the dried bone like scabs. The skull of the specimen rattles, goes limp, picks itself up again. Margot appears next to Daiquiri, her twenty-two locked. Daiquiri assumes his position, keeping his back to hers, glancing around the perimeter of the fair for other intruders. Put your hands up! Margot yells. We'll shoot! The creature ignores her. It digs its fingers into the bark. Miniature petals of yellow and blue fall to the dirt like torn butterfly wings. It puffs out its chest, revealing mossy algae that falls from its ribs like drapes. Daiquiri is not sure what the creature was and refuses to attempt to conceptualize its existence. Last warning! Margot yells. The specimen twitches again. Its jaw hangs limp, tethered by a brittle tendon corroded by algae. Ladybugs trail along its face, its spongy limbs. The leaves rustle the water pressed against the marshy shore. Vibrations sweep, almost like an ambush, from the edges of the woods and the abandoned stalls to their vehicle. The specimen looks on, dumbly, blankly, a sunflower dangling like a broken limb. The vibrations form words. Herein lies the moss prophet. It bounces from the leaves and through the blades of grass, over the stalks of the sunflowers and the canopy of moss that tethers each abandoned tent. 
It does not come from the specimen, although the vines extending from its spinal cord are now taut and attached to something in the dark ether behind the trees. The ropes vibrate with the words, like the twanging of an instrument. Wherever you are, come out. We have backup arriving any minute. Margot verges on trembling. It's not talking to us, Dacry says, goosebumps popping up along his arms. It's talking at us. Accept palms up to the sun and rejoice. The vibrations turn into pulses of sound, pushing his sweat matted hair on end through an invisible wave of static electricity. A low murmur travels along the grounds, moving in and out, in and out, like a heartbeat. The sunflower stands on end, inflated. The specimen adjusts its hold on the trees. Terra incognita, the moss prophet will show the way. Margo, Dacry says. His attention shifted from left to right. Each creaking branch and twirl of leaves becomes a threat. He feels the forest watching him. More so, he feels the ferris wheel looming in the distance, now a giant ebony spoke against an orange sky. The electric pulses swirl around them. Energy is focusing here, encroaching from the limits of the fairgrounds, crawling with moss-gloved skeletal hands up the marshy banks. Their vehicle turns into an island. Should I shoot? Margot says. Rejoice. Yes, Dacry affirms, afraid to look away. Sounds explode to his left, dispersing the thick cloud of noise that had invaded and violated the air. The petals on the sunflower fall at once, untethered to the skull. The jawbone plummets back in the abyss. Its torso goes limp, held up by the vine-replaced tendons of the forearms. It adjusts itself, headless, clawing the bark for purchase. The vibrations end like the abrupt cease of rain. The echoes fade, morphing into a guttural sound projected at the ends of the specimen's marionette strings. The voice is high-pitched and pluralist, it sounds like the organized effort of a hundred voices speaking in harmonic timber from the precipice of the dark. This is the correct path. The moss prophet knows the way. The skeleton loses balance and falls onto the ground. Candy wrappers and cups crinkle under its weight. Beyond the foliage, the vines become slack, taut, and slack again. Dacry senses something breathing at the end of those vines some primordial force, some beastly evil. It permeates a psychic prodding of dread and powerful eyes staring at him from the darkness. It is not angry eyes. He was being judged. Dacry starts to make his way across the grounds. No, Margot said. Hell no. Margot, we need to see it. Not with two 22s we don't. She stares at Dacry. Her brow creases. I feel it too, that force. Whatever it is. I'm not talking about the surround sound vibrations. Something beyond the trees. Yes, you're being stupid. She pulls at his wrist. I need to find out, Dacry says. That's why we were called here. We were not called to die. This is bigger than us. Dacry unlatches himself. The skeleton emitted a sour smell even from this distance. It is both the scent of rotting vegetables and of decaying flesh. The vines look like umbilical cords. Whatever force that once stares at them and speaks from the undersides of the foliage is no longer there. Dacry is certain that it no longer watches them because of how intense its absence. He needs to find out, to venture across the crumbling skeleton, to step along the dead leaves and wade through the steady heartbeats of the chirping crickets. He needs to know something, anything about the moss prophet. He needs to stand where the force is to know that it is true, that it is not some cosmic entity or god. Because what if it is? He stops at the click of the 22's safety. Dacry looks over his shoulder and down the barrel of Margot's gun. Her hands tremble, eyes red. If you take another step forward, I will kill you. Margot. Dacry resists a smile. The situation is so surreal, it is sobering. What are you doing? Do you want to become one of those creatures? Do you want to let whatever monster take you so the next agents come by can find you popping out of a portageon? Do you want to be the creature that you were keen on investigating in the first place? 
Do you want to be a fucking sunflower? Daiquiri bites his lip. He looks over to the darkness, to the crumbling skeleton. Crickets chirp and green head flies skate along the marsh. The ferris wheel looms, watching them as if with some great eye. A wind carries along the water, bringing with it the smell of the marsh and mud, sweeping the rotting carcass stench back into the forest. He stares back at Margot, at the darkness of the pistol. He shakes his head, swears under his breath, and brushes past her, fumbling for his cigarette as he makes his way back to the car. He opens the door and rolls down the window, staring at Margot as she returns the pistol to its holster, breathing with relief. Smoke trails from Daiquiri's fingers. The pyre leans, almost limp, over the open window. They stared at one another from across the grounds, separated by the windshield. He gestures for Margot to join him in the car. She chewed on the inside of her lip and walked along. At once, a thrush of vines whip like tentacles from the darkness, like Kalalu, like the Kraken. A great and evil force wraps pensile and thorny vines around Margot, constricting her like a boa. Gunshot sounds as ribs crack, the movement so swift that she does not cry out, only her eyes realizing that she is being lifted off the ground and turned into mush. A vine slithers over her neck, twists, pulls, and Margot goes limp, crucified against the bark of a gnarled tree, a marionette, just like this specimen. Daiquiri pulls his pistol out of its holster, ready to get out of the car. The forest vibrates again. Follow, follow. The vines tear Margot to pieces, her limbs separating in fireworks of blood and bone. Her body, now fragments of meat, disappears into the darkness of the trees, into the gurgling mess of the moss prophet's abode. Daiquiri closes the door, his hands shaking as the marsh creeps to the vehicle. A green silhouette of something humanoid, but not human, is visible behind a thicket of intertwined branches. Something with one yellow and one purple eye. Not Margot. A bit of an ash from the cigarette falls onto his shirt, snapping him to attention. He starts the car, reverses, speeds through the muddy marsh that looks different from when he came. He travels alone, underneath the banner for the town fair which is not crusted with splotches of moss. Parked cars look aged through desolation, furry with writhing lichen and dotted with speckles of yellow and red flowers in full bloom. Already bodies have begun their transformation into the botanical collective. Eyes rattle, listless, a content primordial bliss. Tears sting Daiquiri's eyes, but he does not wipe them away. His cigarette cradles between his lips, his tongue occasionally lapping against the papery, acrid butt hardly puffing. He drives onward through the town, aiming to get back to the precinct and warn the others that something, someone, is coming. Evacuate the town. Evacuate the county. Evacuate Florida. The other end of the road, right before town, there is a cavalcade of large tank-like vehicles. Men in jumpsuits and gas masks peek out of the backs of these iron hulks, looking around at the marsh, the muggy sky. Sunshine reflects sabers of light from their ruby goggles like they are blinking at Daiquiri. Police tape has cordoned off the road. Daiquiri stops at their command. Someone with a flamethrower and a gas tank strapped to their back comes over. He asks for Daiquiri's ID and Daiquiri shows him his badge. This relaxes the guard a bit. What is going on here? Daiquiri asks. Some sort of virus, the man says his breathing electronic and labored by the mask. Still looking for patient zero. Daiquiri nods. Without a second thought, drives past the checkpoints, smashes through the police tape and wooden barriers, and burns tires past all the sanitation vehicles that have been set up like little carnival games. There is a crowd of people standing on the sides of the road, dressed in robes, shouting, Moss Prophet cometh, Moss Prophet cometh, palms up and rejoice. And Daiquiri drives, thinking of the specimen, thinking of the sunflowers and the Ferris wheel and the dunk tank. He pulls over on the side of the road, lightheaded and hot, and begins to weep for Margot's last moments of life. Twenty minutes later, he reaches into his pocket for another cigarette. His wrist turns upward as he flicks the lighter, notices a little dandelion, 
sprouted from his forearm. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by BetterHelp. Friends, you need better help. No, seriously, you need better help. Look, I understand where you're coming from, but take it from me. I still remember what life was like before our most vital innovations. I remember physically chopping lettuce before the salad shooter was invented. I was cooking burgers like a caveman back when the lean mean grilling machine was just a glimmer in George Foreman's eye. I recall long days on the porch, whittling away at potatoes to make my own julienne fries one at a time. They were simpler times, those days on the porch. And listen, if you'd asked me back then in those days if I needed an electric butter knife or an avocado hugger or a glue gun style fondue shooter, I'd have told you, nah, I don't need any of those fancy inventions. I do just fine on my own. But there's no need to be on your own these days. Those simple times are in the past, and when life challenges only mounting, insurmountably mounting, we can all use a little help. My point is this. Think of all the time and trouble I could have saved myself if I'd been on board with the latest innovations, and think about how well you could be doing with the latest innovation in therapy, better help. BetterHelp is the fastest, easiest, most convenient way to get professional counseling. Within 48 hours, you'll be chatting with someone who specializes in your needs, be they depression, anxiety, family or relationship problems, or anything at all. This isn't a self-help program or a crisis line. It's real therapy done online. You can reach out to your therapist anytime and receive timely responses. You can schedule weekly phone or video sessions. You can even message your therapist ahead of time to let him or her know what you'd like to discuss during your next call. And talk about convenience. You can do it all from your phone. It's professional therapy in your pocket. No travel or office visits required. It's also more affordable than traditional therapy with financial aid available if you need it. Necessity is the mother of invention, folks. So really, would they have invented better help if we didn't need it? Would over one million people have used it if it weren't the best thing since sliced bread? Friends, so many people are using BetterHelp, they're recruiting counselors in all 50 states. Mental health is just as important as physical health listeners. So tonight, while you're shooting that salad, don't forget about vitamins B and H, because whether you know it or not, we could all do better with a little counseling. So let's quit doing things the hard way and get with the times. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash chilling. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash chilling. Thank you for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. I hope you enjoyed Beyond the Zero, as written by Glenn B. Dungan and voiced by Paul J. McSorley and Justine Anastasia. Voice actor Paul J. McSorley's talents can be found on our very own Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, as well as on past episodes of the Simply Scary podcast. You can also keep up with him weekly on his new show, Fear from the Heartland, which will debut in podcast format in early 2022. Meanwhile, capture the magic or the madness <laughs> from the very beginning and check out his show on our YouTube channel today. You'll be glad you did. And after you drop by, don't forget to let him know you heard him here on this show. Our second tale of the evening is written by Cryptic Wonder and performed by Olivia Steele, Jesse Cornett, 
and Negorov. In it, we will greet the week before Valentine's Day, as a young woman named Oletta goes on a normal trip to the grocery store. Everything that happens after that is anything but. Now, without further ado, I present to you my Valentine's Day tragedy. My name is Oletta Walsh, and this all happened about a year ago. This is a difficult story for me to write. My life has been destroyed since it all happened, and honestly, I don't want to tell it. But my therapist said it would be good for me. I was 24 at the time, and it was like four days before Valentine's Day. I was at the grocery store here in town, I won't say which one, and I was just about to check out before a guy named Mark started talking to me while we stood in line. He wore a coat with the logo of the same concrete business where my mother worked. He definitely wasn't ugly and seemed to be pretty well off, but I wasn't looking for love. I was still living with my mother and my career as a web designer hadn't quite taken off yet. Still, the small talk was nice at first. You know, Valentine's Day is coming up. It would be a shame for a beautiful woman like you to be alone on it. I blushed at this. Well, thank you. You definitely know how to make a girl feel special. But I'm afraid I'm not available. Oh, you have a boyfriend? He asked, raising his eyebrows. No. No, I don't feel ready for a relationship. Well, it doesn't have to be all that bad, does it? A night together, just me and you, maybe sharing that lip balm? He said, nodding to the tube I placed on the belt. Now it seemed whenever his eyes weren't meeting mine, they were rolling up and down my body. I felt naked at that moment, and I just wanted to leave. Uh, no, that's okay. Thank you, though, I replied, and turned the other way to face the cashier. I was hoping that would be the end of it, but as I told the cashier my phone number for my reward points, the man behind me persisted. You are quite beautiful. I think we would be great together. I tried to ignore him as the cashier rang up my groceries. You have an amazing smile. I really can't get enough of it, you know? You should smile more. The cashier seemed to sense my discomfort and asked. So, uh, Oleta, we're still on for dinner later, right? I smiled at this, looking at the weirdo behind me and replied. I wouldn't miss it, Mason, seeing the name tag on his vest. This seemed to work as the guy behind me broke all contact. I could still feel his eyes burning their way through my clothes, but... I thanked Mason and was able to go on my way. Later that night, I was sitting on the couch next to my mom, watching TV. It was almost 9pm, and my phone began to vibrate. Before I could even check the text, another came through, then another. Opening them up, they were from an unknown number. Hey, Oletta. It was great to meet you. What are you doing right now? We should go on a date. You would get to like me. I recoiled at seeing these, so much so that my mom snapped her head over and asked, What's wrong? I proceeded to tell her the events at the grocery store and showed her the texts. You think that's Mark? Let me take a look, she said, pulling up her phone and list of contacts. No, that's not him. His area code isn't 207. Pretty sure that creep was the only one who was hitting on me today. Well, I'll have a talk with him, all right? He's probably just overexcited. Don't start losing your mind over it, she said, and we resumed watching TV. I woke up to a dozen texts from the same number the next morning. I called my phone provider and had my number changed. That seemed to do the trick. The rest of the morning was pretty uneventful. I had a couple of small jobs updating some websites and getting traffic. I finished around 1 p.m. and went back to the grocery store to get some food for Caution, my mother's dog. I was feeling kind of nervous that I might run into Mark again, but I felt a little better as I walked by the employee picnic table. 
Mason was on break and gave me a smile and a wave. I waved back and made my way inside. My fears were soon realized when I saw none other than Mark as I walked past the paper plates and stuff. I expected there to be some big episode, but he just gave me a weak smile and nodded, then went back to picking which tinfoil he wanted. I smiled out of instinct, but quickly backtracked around the other side of the aisle. This was insane. Yesterday was the first time I had ever met him, and now suddenly I saw him two days in a row. Was I going to have to stop coming here when I needed groceries? I briefly considered just leaving, but I didn't want caution to go hungry. So, as quickly as I could, I went around the aisle and grabbed a bag of Purina. To my relief, Mark was no longer there and I took my time heading to the checkout, making sure to check if Mark was down any of the aisles so as not to catch me off guard again. Twenty minutes went by when I was satisfied, and I saw Mason was back at a spot. I breathed a sigh of relief and let him check me out. <laughs> Missed you at dinner yesterday, he said with a chuckle. I laughed along with him. <laughs> Sorry, I already had plans with the sofa. Nothing wrong with that. I'll have to take a rain check. Your number doesn't seem to work for the rewards. I forgot I changed my number. I was so lost in my thoughts. It would be a pain to call all the places like the bank and stuff and let them know, but at least Mark didn't have it anymore. Yeah, sorry, I got a new one, I said as I typed it into the keypad. Yeah, well, there's a lot of creeps out there. I couldn't help but notice your friend on his way out. Thank you again for yesterday. That was sweet of you. Not to worry. I'll always be there for you, he said with a wink. We said our goodbyes and I went to my car. I threw the dog food in the passenger seat and felt my stomach drop when I saw what it landed on. In the seat was a card, and with it, a gold locket and chain. The front of the card had a giant red heart with an arrow going through it. On the back was printed a note. Oletta. I know that all of this is sudden, but believe me when I say that I love you. They say love doesn't exist at first sight, but yesterday, the first moment I laid eyes upon you, I knew that it did. We were meant to be together, and I know that in time, you will come to love me just as much. It's too soon for us to meet just yet. But believe me when I say I'm counting the days. Until then, my love, please accept this gift as a token of my esteem. It was my grandmother's, and I know she would want you to have it. I'll see you again soon, my darling. Forever yours, M. I gave a revolted shudder and ripped the card up. Not thinking twice about it, I rolled down my window and threw the locket out onto the ground. I gave a quick look around the parking lot, feeling like there were eyes on me from every direction. I went straight home and hid the rest of the evening. My mom came home around six, and she could tell I was shaken. She tried to comfort me, telling me that she had talked to Mark about the texts. He denied it and even showed her I wasn't on his contact list. I thanked her, but it didn't make me feel a whole lot better. Texts and names can be deleted. Plus, if he had a separate phone, that wouldn't prove anything. I didn't say any of this to her or tell her what was left in my car. I didn't want her to worry over my problem. In hindsight, I should have. Nothing happened the next couple of days. I didn't go out and I was starting to feel a bit more normal again. Then one night... I was up in my room doing random things on my laptop when Caution began barking like crazy. I yelled down to her to be quiet a few times, and finally, she did. I went back to my computer when my phone vibrated. I looked down on it and was in shock. It was the same number that was texting me the other night. Look on your porch. Mom wasn't home, so I was starting to panic. Slowly, I made my way down, where Caution ran up to greet me. I looked out the door's window and didn't see anyone out there. I opened it a crack, and to my relief, there was nothing. As my mind began to reason with it, 
I felt another text come through. No. Back door. I looked over to the sliding glass door and saw something under a rock. With caution in tow, I went towards it, was relieved to see nobody standing there, and looked down at the note. It had a large heart on it, like the one from my car. I ran out to grab it and ran back in as fast as I could and heard the tink of something falling to the wood. It was a ring. Taking another look to make sure it was clear, I picked it up to look at it. It was gold and beautifully decorated with gemstones. Whether it was worth a fortune or not, I threw it into the backyard as far as I could. I went back inside and wiped my hands off my shirt like I just touched something disgusting. Oletta, did you not like my gift? It's okay. You must be shy. You're so adorable, my darling. Well, I hope you'll like this gift. This ring was my mother's engagement ring. It is 24 karat gold and is bejeweled with three diamonds with an AGS rating of three. It was given to her by the man of her dreams, just as I give it to you now. Precious Oletta, will you marry me? You don't have to answer me now. I know that you wouldn't want to be with any other guy, and I promise to make you the happiest woman in the world. I know that your mother wouldn't approve. In fact, I took it upon myself to ask her, but her answer was, well, less than satisfactory. No, she didn't take it well and seemed upset that I would text you like that. She threatened to turn me over to the police, and anyone that would try to stand in the way of our love doesn't deserve to be a part of your life. She won't bother us anymore, though. We can and will be together forever. It's almost our special day. Just one more to go. Be ready. Your loving fiancé. M. I can't begin to tell you all the different thoughts and feelings that ran through me at that moment. Somehow I fought through it and dialed my mom. It rang until it got to her voicemail. Mom, please tell me you're okay. I can't handle this. Please call me back. I hung up and dropped to the ground and just cried until I fell asleep. When I opened my eyes, it was early in the morning. The sun was starting to come up and I looked around for any sign of my mom. There was nothing, and her car was still not in the driveway. I called the police, and they came by. A whole lot of good that did. They looked at the note and the texts, but said without any more evidence they couldn't file a kidnapping report or even a missing persons without her missing for 24 hours. I begged them to stay and help, but they said they could do nothing except come by if anything else happened. I nodded and sat on the couch for a while, hoping my mother would call me back. In my heart, I knew she wouldn't. I worried the rest of the day, and as the sun set once more, I began to panic. It was the night of Valentine's Day, and I knew he would be here at some point. I didn't have much to protect me aside from caution, so I grabbed a knife from the kitchen and hid in my room. Nothing happened until much later. I think it was around one o'clock in the morning. I must have dozed off because I jolted upright, knife in hand when caution started to bark like crazy. I got up and heard someone moving around downstairs. Not thinking twice, I dialed 911 and told them there was an intruder. They told me to stay in my room and stay on the line. The woman was trying to keep me talking, but I dropped the phone when I heard the doorknob to my room begin to rattle. Caution was going nuts, and I held the knife at the ready. There was a loud boom of a gunshot as the lock to my door disappeared, and it flung open. Go away, Mark! I don't love you! I yelled. But I was dumbstruck when I saw that it wasn't Mark. It was Mason. 
My dog lunged at him and was biting at the arm holding the gun. Thank God he couldn't get a good shot, and I ran past them and down the stairs. The front door was wide open, and I could see the red and blue lights of police cars from outside. Two officers came in with their guns drawn, and they ushered me past them. I flinched when I heard another two shots from behind me. And it was all sort of a blur after that. Mason had been the one stalking me all this time. And he had killed my mother. If it wasn't for my brave girl caution, I couldn't imagine the things that freak would have done to me. Unfortunately, in the struggle, he managed to kill her too. It's been a while now. And even though Mason will be behind bars for many years, I can't get past it. I get panic attacks whenever any guy shows the slightest bit of interest in me, and I've become a recluse. That's pretty much my story. Hopefully, no one else ever has to go through something like that again. I hope you enjoyed My Valentine's Day Tragedy, as written by Cryptic Wonder and voiced by Olivia Steele, Jesse Cornett, and Nick Goroff. To find more of author Cryptic Wonder, visit their Reddit page. If you enjoyed Mr. Cornett's performance, you can hear more of him on the Chilling Tales YouTube channel, as well as on the No Sleep podcast, where you can hear his vocal performances as well as production. Voice actor and 2016 Evil Idol champion Nick Goroff's talents can be found on our very own Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, as well as on past episodes of the Simply Scary podcast. You can also join Nick on his YouTube channel, Wizard of Cause. If you drop by, don't forget to let him know you heard him here. You can hear more of Olivia Steele right here on our very own network as well as on her YouTube channel called Scarily Olivia. Now, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back a decade to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. Segment final sign-off. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. <laughs>